Good morning, everyone. Good morning, I'm David Feldman. I'm a medical project director at the National Kidney Foundation. I'm filling in for Kevin Longino. Um, unfortunately, Kevin can't be here today because of a pressing uh, family matter. Um, he was really looking forward to being at this meeting. He sends his regrets for um, unfortunately not being able to be here. So, on behalf of the National Kidney Foundation and the Alport Syndrome Foundation, it is my great pleasure to welcome you and to our, our webinar audience to today's externally led patient focused drug development meeting on Alport Syndrome. This is the second ELP FTD meeting on kidney disease, and at the National Kidney Foundation, we're really pleased to partner with the Alport Syndrome Foundation for today's meeting. And for me, it's been uh, a great experience to work with Gina Parzial, the Executive Director of uh, the ASF. So according to our um, registration data, 82 people registered for today's meeting, coming from 21 states and Puerto Rico. Uh, we don't have the final, or I don't have the final uh, um, registration for the webinar, but just a few minutes ago, it was 72 people who were registered. Um, so for you folks on the webcast, um, thank you very much for in advance for sticking with us uh, for the next several hours. So at the National Kidney Foundation, we're really happy that the focus of today's meeting is on Alport Syndrome because uh, we believe that today's proceedings will be a strong step to address the enormous uh, unmet medical needs of this community. So we thank you all for uh, your commitment to this effort and traveling here uh, for the meeting and for what we expect will be your very active participation in, in today's meeting. Uh, we especially want to thank our panelists. You people have worked so hard and with such dedication to make your testimonies meaningful and informative. It's been a true pleasure for Gina and James and myself to work with you. Thank you very much. We also want to thank our honorary chairman of the meeting, Dr. Clifford Cashton from the University of Minnesota, and our co-chairs, Dr. Michelle Rowe, for also from University of Minnesota, and Dr. James Simon from the Cleveland Clinic. Thank you very much for your invaluable advice during the planning of this meeting, and we look forward to the presentations that will form the basis for today's discussions. And we want to thank especially and very warmly welcome our friends from the U.S. Food and Drug Administration who have taken the time to be here today. Uh, and we all know that you have very busy schedules and we appreciate your, your being here. What we want to do today is generate information that will help the FDA make decisions when they evaluate the pros and cons of new potential drugs for AS. So information that will help them to approve drugs that meet the needs of the AS patients. And we're going to generate this information by hearing from all of you, your experiences with AS and what you need in new treatments. As important as this meeting is for the FDA, it's also important for you in the AS community because it's your opportunity to speak directly to the FDA and voice your experience with this disease and what you need from new therapeutics. The FDA recognizes you as experts in facing AS and they want to hear your experiences and preferences. So please don't be shy today. This meeting could not take place without the sponsorship from Riata, Retrofin, Beringer, Ingelheim, Lilly, and Regulus, and we greatly appreciate their support. Finally, I'd like to add a more personal note. Over the last several months, I've come to know many of you through emails and uh, phone calls, but I also had the privilege of reading almost 200 responses from our pre-meeting survey. And through the phone calls and the emails and reading the survey responses, I can begin to understand the burdens of, that many of you face. 
But I've also seen your fortitude, your resilience, and your determination to fight Alport syndrome. And I know, I know that all of this and more will come out today at this meeting. So now it's my great pleasure to welcome to the podium Dr. Ellis Unger. Dr. Unger is the director of the Office of Drug Evaluation One, which is in the Office of New Drugs, which is in the Center of Drug Evaluation and Research, also known as CEDAR. And all of this is in the FDA. Dr. Unger will speak on how the FDA uses patient input from ELPFTD meetings. Dr. Unger. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Very glad to have all of you here. Glad to see so many uh, patients, I guess 80 patients registered here and about the same number on the web. I'd like to thank all of you for being part of this meeting and, and sharing your experiences with Alport Syndrome. Um, I'd like to also thank the National Kidney Foundation and the Alport Syndrome Foundation for setting this up. This is, this is great. I realize we also have some representation here from industry academia and other uh, medical product development stakeholders uh, who are in the room and on the web. And you recognize that FDA plays a critical role in the development of medical products, but some people don't really understand exactly what we do. We're just one part of the process at the FDA, and uh, I'm glad to see a, such a high level of interest uh, from others who play an important role. And we all share a commitment to facilitating the development of new medical products for Alport syndrome. So FDA protects and promotes the public health by evaluating the effectiveness, safety, and also the manufacturing quality of new drug products. And we work with companies to develop the drug products. But it may come as a surprise to you that the FDA doesn't actually do studies on patients. A lot of people seem to have the misperception that we do studies. Um, we don't actually do patient research at FDA. It's the medical product companies, sometimes working with researchers, uh, patient communities who conduct the trials and then submit the applications of new drugs to the FDA. But we play a critical role in making sure that the trials that the company conduct are scientifically rigorous and that the trials are performed well and that the welfare of patients is protected. Basically, we want to make sure that when the company invests the resources and the patients invest all their time and energy into participating in a trial, that the information that we get at the end is useful to us. It's not a bunch of gobbledygook. It's, very, it's not difficult to, to do a trial poorly and then have people say at the end of the trial when they're looking at the data, gee, I, I can't interpret what you did. I don't understand this endpoint. So we play a very important role during drug development in helping the companies design the trials that they will run, that we will evaluate in the end to make a decision about whether the drugs are safe or effective. And it's at the design phase, when we're designing the studies, that your input is critical. And frankly, it's mostly been lacking because one of the important aspects of a trial, maybe the most important aspect of a trial is what is the trial measuring? What is it that we're measuring? Are we measuring something that matters to a patient? There are really two questions. Are we measuring something that matters to a patient? And at the end of the day, when you show a change in two points on a scale, the difference between the drug and the placebo, a two-point difference, making that up, what does that mean? Is a two-point difference meaningful to patients, or is it not? And that has to be balanced against the harms we, we, call them, we call them risks, but risks are a euphemism for harm, okay? Drugs can cause harm. So that two-point change in a scale, how do you balance that against the harms of the drug? So we can ask the patients, hopefully, prospectively, in advance, well, what would matter to you in terms of your symptoms? And what would matter to you in terms of harms that the drug might cause? And the only place to get the information is from patients. We don't know what it's like to have Alport syndrome. Um, we don't know, but you do. And so you can provide this critical input that, that we need. Um, 
I'd like to give you a little bit of background. I was asked to give you a little bit of background on the patient-focused drug development meetings in general. FDA launched this patient-focused drug development initiative under something called PDUFA-5, which is the fifth authorization of the Prescription Drug User Fee Act in 2012. We did the, uh, we initiated this series because we recognized that there was a need for more systematic collection of, of um, endpoint information. In other words, collection of this kind of information, what matters to patients. Um, and we wanted information on patients' perceptions of the treatment options that were available, what treatment options patients might like to be available, and also the, the, the risks or the harms. And I think by most accounts, the meetings have been highly successful. This is probably my seventh or eighth patient-focused drug development meeting. Um, we've conducted, we conducted about 20 of them at the FDA as part of the effort. Um, but that was a good start. There, but there are more than 20 diseases out there, obviously. And Alport syndrome didn't, didn't make the initial list. <laughs> so we said, I think wisely, the stakeholders said, why don't you expand the effort? Keep going. Don't stop at 20. But it was a lot for the FDA, truthfully. Uh, um, and so we handed the ball off to the various stakeholder organizations. We said, well, why don't you, you know, basically host the patient-focused drug development meeting and we'll come. And this is essentially what we do at the FDA, except it's a more interesting venue. So this is great. So we started welcoming patient organizations to do this, and this is why all of you are here today, and, and it's great. Um, I was also asked to provide some examples of um, what I've learned um, at some of these patient-focused drug meetings. And I'll just give you a couple examples. One was um, we had a patient-focused drug development meeting for autism, autism spectrum. And um, we'd spoken to a number of drug companies about developing studies to, to um, evaluate drugs for autism. And there's a, a behavior that, uh, that individuals with autism can have. It's called stimming. And stimming is a repetitive behavior. It's, it, it's uh, you know, a pacing in a room or, or some uh, movement. And the company said, gee, um, if we show that a patient has less stimming, then doesn't that mean the drug's effective? And the patients lined up at the microphone. They said, no, stimming is a coping mechanism. We like it. You may not like watching us when we have stimming, but it doesn't bother us. You're focused on the wrong thing. So that, that's, one, that's one example. Another example um, is... Um, and drugs for, um, it's called pulmonary hypertension. Um, and in that disease, we've often looked to the distance a patient can walk in six minutes. You're, you're really measuring walking speed. Um, and that's been the end point. And I frankly had serious doubts about it because um, patients don't get up in the morning and say, oh, let me see how far I can walk in six minutes today. That's not really how they measure their quality of life. But lo and behold, almost every patient in the room said, yes, I know what six minute walk is and I pay attention to it. And every time I go to the doctor, he or she measures it and I keep track of it. So it was rather enlightening to hear that, in fact, this was a meaningful endpoint. So there's an example of an endpoint that we thought was meaningful that wasn't. And another endpoint that we thought, I thought wasn't meaningful and it turns out that it is. So we, this is the kind of information that we get from patients like you. Um, we understand that Alport syndrome is, is a serious condition. It has physical, emotional, and social impacts. Um, and the dialogue today uh, with, with patients like you and, uh, will help us better understand Alport uh, syndrome, help us learn which symptoms and problems are important to you, which symptoms are perhaps not so important. And again, this information is extremely helpful to us as we guide companies in design and trials to evaluate drugs. For Alport Center. So we'll have an opportunity to hear directly from you, patients who are experts on what it's like to live with this condition, about the symptoms that matter most to you, the impact the condition has on your daily lives. That's something that's really hard to get at your head around, but I'm hoping you guys can help us. Your experience with the current uh, treatments uh, that are available. And then we look forward to incorporating everything that we learn here in our thinking and understanding how patients feel and 
how they value various uh, uh, benefits and risks of therapies for Alport syndrome. So once again, we're all here today to hear your voices, the voice of the patients, so thank you for your participation. Don't be shy. I'll echo the first speaker. We're, we're grateful to all of you uh, for being here today and sharing your personal uh, stories, experiences, and perspectives. I know it's, it's not necessarily that easy. Um, it's, it's easy to talk about you know, how, how well you're doing, but to actually sit down face to face and talk about what it is that bothers you on a day to day basis is not something most people, you don't talk to your neighbor about it. But we really do want to hear that conversation. So again, thank you very much, and I, I thank the organizers for inviting me. <clears throat> thank you, Dr. Unger, for that uh, very clear and informative presentation. Um, I think very clearly illustrates why we're here today. Uh, so now it's my uh, great pleasure to introduce Dr. Michelle Rowe. Dr. Rowe is a pediatric nephrologist and associate professor of pediatrics at the University of Minnesota in Minneapolis. And Dr. Rowe is an expert in Alport syndrome and will speak about the natural history and treatment of the disease. Welcome, Dr. Rowe. So good morning, everyone. Um, so my job is to just talk a little bit about Alport syndrome to make sure we're all on the same page as we're starting to talk about, or as we uh, continue the conversations today. So we've known about Alport syndrome for almost 100 years now. Alport syndrome was first described by Cecil Alport, who was a South African uh, physician back in 1927. And he described a family with kidney disease and hearing loss where predominantly men were affected, although some of the women were affected as well. It wasn't until 1990, uh, many years later, that we realized that Alport syndrome was caused by mutations in three different genes, col 4 a 3 col 4 a 4 and col 4 a 5 And these genes um, tell the cells how to make type 4 collagen, which is a certain type of collagen that's found in the kidney and in the ear and the eye. So these three different genes can cause Alport syndrome. It's a genetically complex disease. Um, COL4A5 is found on the X chromosome. Uh, and this uh, mutations here cause X-linked Alport syndrome, which is the most common type of Alport syndrome. COL4A3 and COL4A4 are found on one of the autosomes, which basically means it's not the X or Y chromosome. Uh, if you have one mutation in each of your um, uh, col 43 uh, genes, then you have autosomal recessive Alport syndrome. And if you only have one mutation, then you may have autosomal dominant Alport syndrome. And the genetics of this disorder, it's important to think about in detail because it helps to understand how this disorder affects families, because it really is a disease of families. So in this situation, if you have an um, affected mother, so she has one of her X chromosomes has a mutation, the other one does not. Um, when she has children, she will pass on that affected gene to half of her children, and it doesn't matter whether they're boys or girls. So half of her children will be uh, affected by Alport syndrome. If she passes it on to her son, males, boys only have one X chromosome, so they are affected. Um, her daughters will have one affected and one uh, normal COL4A5 gene, so they will be variably affected. In autosomal recessive Alport syndrome, each parent carries one copy of that abnormal gene, and they have a 25% chance um, of both of them passing that gene onto their, um, onto their children. And in this case, it doesn't matter if it's boy or girl, um, just doesn't matter. So about 25% of, of those parents' children will be affected by autosomal recessive Alport syndrome. So what are these uh, type 4 collagen genes doing in the body? 
Well, one of the things that's very important about type 4 collagen uh, is that it makes up part of the kidney filtration barrier. And within each kidney, there's about a million filtering units called glomeruli. And each of these glomeruli um, has filters that filter the blood. And they make sure that toxins, salts, other electrolytes get out into the urine, and that blood and protein and all of the things that are supposed to be in your blood stays in your blood. And it's a three-part um, three membrane. There are cells on the blood side. Then there's this part here that's called the um, glomerular basement membrane. And this is the important part in Alport syndrome because that's where the type 4 collagen is. And then there are also cells on the top called podocytes. And all three of these together make up that filtration barrier in the kidney. So how can three different genes, mutations in three different genes, cause Alport syndrome? Why do they all cause the same disease? And to understand that, we have to understand how that type 4 collagen works. So each of those genes makes a specific protein, the alpha-3, alpha-4, or alpha-5 type 4 collagen. And then those proteins wind together to form a triple helix. So they um, very tightly coil around each other to form um, a tighter rope or a tighter chain of type 4 collagen. These uh, triple helixes then get together and they form this meshwork that makes up that glomerular filtration barrier. So it's very important that this normal meshwork is present so the basement membrane is working normally. If you have a COL4A5 mutation, for example, then you still make the alpha-3 and alpha-4 chains, but you may not make that alpha-5 chain anymore. So if you don't have the alpha-5 chain, then you can't make that, uh, that triple helix anymore. You have to have all three of those chains in order to make that triple helix. So the alpha-3 and alpha-4 chains just get degraded. They don't know what to do with themselves anymore. And then you have no alpha-3, alpha-4, alpha-5 network in that basement membrane. So the basement membrane is, uh, starts off being very abnormal. If you have just a mild mutation in uh, COL4A5, so maybe it's not that the protein is completely absent, it just has a kink in that chain. Um, what happens then is the triple helix may be able to form, it's just abnormal, it's not quite right. So then when it forms that meshwork, you have a meshwork that's not quite normal. So when that basement membrane is abnormal, um, patients with Alport syndrome go through a very distinct pattern of progression of their kidney disease. Right at birth, um, most patients will have blood in their urine if you test. And the blood can be microscopic, where you have to look under a microscope to see it, or it can be gross, which means that we see it um, with our eyes when we look at the urine. Um, after blood in the urine comes the microalbuminuria, or small amount of protein in the urine stage. Um, after that comes protein in the urine, so more protein in the urine, and then chronic kidney disease, where the kidney filtration actually starts to decrease. And finally, end-stage kidney disease, where you need dialysis or kidney transplant. So what is the risk of needing dialysis or transplant if you're a patient with Alport syndrome? And I'm sorry, I didn't know I was going to have two screens. I can't point at both, <laughs> so I'll try. I'll, and I can't see that one, so I'm going to go over here. Um, so this is a study from, from Europe that was done on over 300 families with uh, X-linked Alport syndrome. And this uh, study was a natural history study, so they just gathered information. Patients weren't treated with anything in particular. And what they found is that um, for males with X-linked Alport syndrome, that's the line here, and we looked at the probability of end-stage kidney disease. So these are patients who need a kidney transplant. About 50% of the boys with X-linked Alport syndrome needed a kidney transplant by the age of 25. So that was uh, pretty, pretty standard. Although you can see there's a, there's a pretty long tail. So even by the time you're age 60 or so, there are still some men with X-linked Alport syndrome who haven't quite needed a kidney transplant yet. 
For women, you recall, they have one normal X chromosome, one abnormal X chromosome, and how much of each is expressed um, can affect how severely women are affected. So in this study, um, by the age of 40, about 12% of women had end-stage kidney disease, and by the age of 60, it was 30 to 40% of women um, had end-stage kidney disease. So in the past, before this study came out, a lot of people considered women with X-linked Alport syndrome to be you know, benign carriers, and they weren't um, followed as closely as they maybe should have been. However, this study showed there really is a risk of end-stage kidney disease for these women who were previously thought to be just asymptomatic carriers. Um, some of our, our more recent data from the ASTRO registry shows that this may be somewhat less. Um, that we found 3% risk of end-stage kidney disease by age 40 and 18% risk by age 60 um, in our most recent uh, look at our registry data. Um, some of that may reflect, um, it's now almost uh, 15 years after this data came out, so there have been changes in the treatment that we'll talk about soon. Autosomal recessive Alport syndrome will follow this same curve as the males with X-linked Alport syndrome. So patients with autosomal recessive Alport syndrome will behave like a male with um, X-linked Alport syndrome, whether they're male or female. Um, autosomal dominant Alport syndrome tends to have less severe kidney disease associated with that. And this is the same type of graph, just flipped upside down. I think all of us scientists need to get together and figure out one way to display our data, but um, just imagine that flipped upside down. And what we see is that the um, 50 or 50% for autosomal dominant Alport syndrome is around age 70. So um, if in the X-linked Alport syndrome, 50% of men needed uh, dialysis or transplant by the age of 25, for autosomal dominant Alport syndrome, it's more like 70 years of age, um, so much later. However, having said that, there are some patients here even at the age of 20 with autosomal dominant Alport syndrome who need dialysis or a kidney transplant. So we can't say everybody with autosomal dominant Alport syndrome does well long term um, because some don't. And we don't have a very good understanding of what, um, how to tell the difference between the two. Hearing loss um, happens in Alport syndrome because that same type 4 collagen that's found in that glomerular basement membrane is also present in the cochlea in the ear. And there's some controversy about how that, um, how mutations in the cochlea actually lead to hearing loss, but we know that it does. For, uh, this is again looking at the risk of hearing loss from the uh, study from Europe. And they found that by um, the age of, let's see, 50% of boys had hearing loss by the age of 15 and about 75% by the age of 20. So it, it's, it's very common um, in males with X-linked Alport syndrome. Uh, in women, it's similar to the kidney disease. They have less um, severe involvement and it usually comes later, but not an insignificant risk of hearing loss in women with X-linked Alport syndrome who had previously been thought of as, as benign carriers. There are also eye abnormalities in Alport syndrome. And these are usually uh, not vision affecting, but they can be. Um, one of the common ones is called anterior lenticonus, which means that your lens of your eye is shaped like a cone. And that happens because the lens of the eye is another place where that type 4 collagen is, is located. Um, so some patients with, with uh, Alport syndrome also have findings in their eyes. So it won't come as a surprise to anyone in this room that there are no FDA-approved therapies for Alport syndrome. So we don't have any medications that we can specifically use to treat um, Alport syndrome. So when doctors don't know what to do with the disease, we turn to our animal models. So back in the um, 90s, early 2000s, um, scientists generated a number of very good animal models for Alport syndrome. So we inserted those um, mutations for type 4 collagen mutations uh, into mice. Um, there were several dog models of Alport syndrome. 
And then we use those models to treat them with various therapies to see if anything could slow down the progression of kidney disease. And this was a study that was done by um, Oliver Gross from Germany, where he took the um, autosomal recessive Alport syndrome mouse and treated them with Ramipril, which is an ACE inhibitor. This is a blood pressure medicine that reduces blood pressure and also has some antifibrotic um, and antiproteinuric uh, effects on the kidney. And what he found, the mice who weren't treated with anything, they die around the, um, 75 days of age, so very, very quickly because they reach end-stage kidney disease. And we don't have any little mouse dialysis, so I'm afraid they all die. Um, if you treat those animals very late with Ramipril, there's no change. So if you wait until they already have chronic kidney disease, um, treating them with Ramipril late really doesn't make much of a difference. If you treat them early for a few weeks, so as soon as they're able to take the medication, you start them on it, treat them for three or four weeks, now we can see that there's a, a improvement in their lifespan by about 20%. So just by treating these animals with a, a commonly available blood pressure medicine can increase their lifespan by 20%. And then what if we treat them early and then just continue it as long as we can? And what he found there is that the lifespan increased by about 50%. Um, so that was, that was pretty remarkable. So based on these findings, he then went into his registry study um, in Germany and looked at patients in his registry who had been treated with ACE inhibitors at various time points along the way. So the, um, the red line there are patients who had never been treated with any medication. So they may, have been, um, they may have shown up late, their physician may have chosen not to treat them with anything. And in those patients, um, the average age of needing dialysis or transplant was, eight, was 22 years. Um, so pretty similar to the, the other data that we had heard. The yellow line that you can see are patients who started an ACE inhibitor late, so after they had already developed some chronic kidney disease. And the average age there, you can see them starting to separate, was about 25 years. So you could get about three years longer of your kidney life um, in patients who had been treated with, um, with ACE inhibitors. And finally, the green line are patients who were started on ACE inhibitors in the protein in the urine stage. So who were started on, on therapy once they already had protein in their urine. And in these patients, the average um, age of needing uh, dialysis or transplant was age 40. So now we're seeing a much longer um, improvement in lifespan in those patients. Now it's important to know that this, this um, study is what we call retrospective. It means we're looking back. It's not the gold standard study where we take everybody in a room and we put some of them on an ACE inhibitor and put some of them not on an ACE inhibitor and see what happens. Um, you can see that type of study here would take us about 50 years, um, and it would be um, almost impossible to, to complete. So we do the best we can to infer from these retrospective studies. So based on the, the animal data and some of the retrospective data, we published um, clinical practice recommendations for the treatment of children with Alport syndrome um, back in 2013. And we recommend that any um, patient with Alport syndrome who has protein in their urine should be treated with an ACE inhibitor. Um, for uh, patients who are suspected to have severe disease, so if it's a male with Alport syndrome who has family members who needed uh, dialysis in their teens or 20s, um, you may consider starting an, an ACE inhibitor even at that microalbuminuria stage, so at that very early, uh, very small amounts of protein stage. And we um, make these recommendations for both males and females uh, with protein in their urine. So despite our best efforts of trying to slow down the disease, some patients will need a kidney transplant with Alport syndrome. And studies have shown that uh, outcomes of kidney transplant in patients with Alport syndrome are equivalent or maybe even a little bit better than some other um, kidney diseases. And that's um, often because patients with Alport syndrome are in general healthy than some of the other types of kidney disease. And they don't have um, certain risk factors that the, the kidney will fail after transplant. Um, in this study, um, this uh, black line here shows basically all their patients who did not have Alport syndrome, how long the kidney lasted after transplant. And uh, this line here, 
are uh, patients with Alport syndrome. So you can see patients with Alport syndrome, their kidneys lasted a little bit longer than patient, their patients overall. Um, after transplant, patients with Alport syndrome can develop what's called anti-glomerular basement membrane disease. Um, and this happens when an individual makes antibodies against that type 4 collagen. So if you've never had type 4 collagen in your body before, um, your body's going to recognize that as foreign, and it's going to try to fight that off after transplant. Um, so you develop antibodies against that type 4 collagen membrane. And this can lead to loss of the transplant, and it happens in about 2% of males in a recent review. So it's not everybody, um, and it's, it's a small percentage, but when it does happen, it can really be devastating. So just to summarize, Alport syndrome has a variable clinical course that depends on genetics and other factors that we're just starting to really understand. Uh, treatment with ACE inhibitors or angiotensin receptor blockers is recommended to slow the progression of kidney disease based on retrospective studies. Uh, and there are no treatments that are currently available to halt or cure the disease. So I'm very much looking forward to hearing everyone's uh, thoughts today. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. That was a really great, very clear, informative um, presentation to set the stage for uh, the next topic. So now we're at the core of the meeting, and um, this is the patient focus part. So to guide us through uh, this part of the meeting, it's really, I'm very happy to introduce uh, Mr. James Valentine. Uh, James is an attorney at Hyman Phelps and McNamara in uh, Washington, D.C., and he works on a variety of healthcare issues. But let me tell you the main reason why we asked James and are, again, delighted that he's uh, going to moderate one of these meetings is, uh, first of all, we have a, we have a, a good, uh, well, a one-year, almost to the day, a relationship with James. Uh, he uh, moderated the um, ELPFDD meeting that we did last year on um, complement three glomerulopathy, which is a, a, a very rare kidney disease. Um, and so we knew you know, that uh, he'd do a spectacular job for this meeting. But, and, and the reason that James is so good at this is that he used to work at the FDA. And while he was at the FDA, he actually helped develop and launch the PFDD program. So he's also moderated 10 of the 15 ELPFDD meetings that have been conducted so far. So that's, he's moderated two thirds of all these meetings. So we're really in good hands. So I'm really happy to turn over the meeting to James. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for the kind introduction, David. It's really a, um, a privilege to get to represent the National Kidney Foundation, and uh, for this program, it's really uh, been a pleasure to get to collaborate with the Alport Syndrome Foundation and Gina. So um, thank you for inviting me into your community for the day, and I really look forward to um, working with all of you over the next uh, few hours as we help uh, bring your voices to the FDA, uh, to uh, clinical and academic researchers that are here in the room and online, and to uh, our industry partners who are also here in the room and online, uh, equally interested to learn from what you have to say today. Uh, so as David mentioned, this is the uh, really the meat of the meeting, what we're all looking forward to, which is um, hearing and learning from all of you. And I want to start by giving a little bit of an overview of exactly the process that we're going to go through in terms of um, soliciting uh, your thoughts, your experiences, your preferences. Um, so our discussion today is really organized into two main topics if you uh, look at the agenda. Our first topic is on disease symptoms and daily impacts. Um, so where we really want to uh, understand how Alport syndrome uh, affects you or your loved one if you're a caregiver. 
um, and how that uh, impacts activities in daily life um, and how that might vary or have changed over time. The second main topic uh, that we are going to try to tackle is get a good understanding of your current approaches to treatment, how well those treatments are working, um, as well as any downsides of those treatments. And as part of that discussion of treatments, we'll also turn to the future um, and get some of your input on what it is really you're looking for from a future treatment for Alport syndrome. Um, we have a unique, uh, somewhat unique element to our agenda today as we transition from topic one on discussing your uh, disease symptoms and daily impacts. Um, but before we move into topic two on uh, approaches to treatment, we're going to have a dialogue about participation in clinical trials in Alport syndrome. So we really want to understand your um, thought process uh, factors that you consider um, when thinking about participating in clinical trials. Um, something that is extremely crucial um, to helping inform the design of clinical studies um, that will really be feasible uh, to conduct in this community. So as we dive into those two topics, the two major topics, um, what we're gonna, the, the first way that we're going to hear from the community is through a set of panel remarks. So we'll have uh, a panel uh, for each of our two topics made up of patients and caregivers who are going to set a foundation for our discussion in that topic area. They were selected to reflect, uh, reflect a range of experiences in Alport syndrome and like I said, they're really going to help kick off the discussion which we will then broaden here in the room um, and online uh, to those of you on the webcast. So the first way we're going to then broaden from the panel is we're going to move into a series of live polling questions. And so this is for all of our patients and caregivers here in the room, as well as online. For uh, those of you in the room, you can use your cell phones, tablets, laptops, um, whatever you might have to be able to uh, do, participate in polling on the web or by text message. Text message. Um, the purpose of these polling questions is to um, get a good sense of the, ex the, the overall experiences of everyone that we have participating in this meeting. Um, these experiences are going to help aid in our um, audience discussion that will follow. Um, and again, this is uh, uh, a way that we'll engage both with our in-person uh, participants as well as our web participants. And then our final way that we're going to hear from all of you today um, is the, a broader audience discussion. So we're going to build on the experiences that we heard from the panel that all of you shared through the polling questions. And I'm going to ask questions and invite you to raise your hand um, and participate in the conversation. Um, and we really, that's how we view this. We want this to be um, a dialogue in the room um, discussing not only topics um, that were covered by our panelists, but also um, experiences that you have that are different. Uh, I also think it's important to note that even if your experiences are mentioned by those on the panel, it's important for FDA and our other um, interested stakeholders to know where there are commonalities in experience. And I'm sure each of you have a personal uh, take on that experience in terms of how something might impact you or maybe how you approached treating your disease. So uh, when we get to that point, you know, I'll ask that you raise your hand, wait to be called on. Um, once you're called on, you'll be able to turn on your microphone uh, at your table and then just please state your name um, before answering that way. Um, as part of our uh, putting together our summary report for this meeting, we'll be able to track um, responses from throughout the day from each of you. Um, beyond what we're doing right here today, um, we know that we have a limited amount of time. There's many of you here in the audience um, and not all of your peers in the community um, were able to make it here today to participate. So um, we will also be soliciting written comments uh, for 30 days following today's meeting um, and all of our patient caregiver uh, registrants will receive a follow-up email with the exact instructions on how to submit those comments by email. Um, all of the information that we collect here today, that we collect by written comments and email, um, the National Kidney Foundation and Alport Syndrome Foundation will be collaborating to write a summary report, which is called a Voice of the Patient Report. Um, this will be the official meeting summary that will be submitted uh, to the Food and Drug Administration. Um, so that way, not only those um, FDA officials that are here in the room and other stakeholders that are here in the room will get to learn from what you, what you said, um, but that will carry on and be able to be utilized um, by reviewers at the agency 
um, and any other stakeholder as uh, actually the, the FDA, in addition to posting it on the organization websites, the FDA has a website to post these externally submitted uh, documents. So before we transition into our uh, first set of polling questions, which will be demographic questions to get a sense of who we have here in the room, I just want to lay out some ground rules. Um, one, and, and I uh, really want to reiterate something that Dr. Unger said, you know, please don't be shy. Um, the only way that we can have a successful meeting today is if uh, as many people that are here as possible contribute. So I encourage every patient, every direct caregiver, family member of someone with Alport syndrome um, to please actively participate. Um, you know, we're, we're here to hear from you. Um, on the other side of that, for, for everyone that's not a patient or a caregiver here in the room, um, know that you're here to listen. Um, so our FDA colleagues, the clinician researchers, industry partners, um, today is the, a day for you to listen and absorb. Um, the questions I'll be posing are for uh, patients and caregivers, um, so please respect that and, and remain in listening mode. And likewise, for our patients and caregivers, um, you're sharing your experiences. We're not going to be asking other stakeholders questions to respond to. You all are the experts that we want to learn from today. Um, we're going to be focusing on, as I mentioned, uh, a number of core topics, symptoms and burdens with the disease, aspects of participating in trials, as well as approaches to treatment. Um, that really is the focus uh, of what we want to discuss today. Um, we'll be sharing discussion questions there in your, um, your program as well. Um, so please uh, stay on topic. Uh, we've designed this to be most informative um, for, the, for the types of information we know is important. Um, to help inform and advance uh, drug development and review by FDA. And lastly, um, of course, all of the views that ex are expressed today are personal ones. Um, and so we just ask that you please be respectful, one of, uh, respectful of one another. Um, we know that there will be um, differences in experiences and in preferences. Um, it's important to hear all of those views. Um, and then so as part of that, we also ask that you um, please be respectful in terms of there's many voices to be here, be heard today, so please try to be um, concise and to the point when you're sharing your experiences. Um, we'll have uh, plenty of time to, to come back as we move throughout the day to each person, so don't feel like the one time you get called on is going to be your only chance to speak.